Last week, I published a conversation about the origin of life with Dr. David Fialo. After we stopped recording, David started talking about information, what it is that's meant by information or should be meant when people are talking about information and the origin of life and information in biology in general. What type of information is being transferred when a chain of nucleic acid is being copied and how do we quantify that information and so on. Now, when we started in on this topic, I realized, hold on, this is important. <laughs> And I stopped him and I asked if he could start over so I could record his thoughts on this issue. What you are about to hear is, I believe, one of the most or maybe the most important conversation that I've had on this channel so far. It really was fascinating. Information is nothing magical. In physics, it's often described simply as that which resolves uncertainty. And... <laughs> I understand that even this definition sounds a little bit magical, a little bit woo-woo. The word uncertainty here sort of implies a mind being involved, but information transfer happens all the time without minds. The universe, physicists often say, is an information processor. When bits of matter interact with each other, information processing is one way to think about that. For example, if a bus smashes into a wall, it transfers information about its velocity and density into that wall, and vice versa. The wall's, quote, uncertainty about the mass and velocity of the bus has been resolved to some degree. It now has a crude representation of that bus in its own structure. The, the hole that's left there, the crater that's left there, is a crude representation of that bus. Likewise, when you take in information through your eyes, that is a physical interaction. It's purely physical. Light is hitting your retina, and it's leaving its mark on your retina. The nature of that impact is then transmitted to your brain, and it's, it affects the structure of your brain. Really, this is physics. Information transfer is really, it's just a physical interaction. There's no woo-woo here. When we're talking about the replication of a chain of RNA, we're talking about the transfer of information about its sequence. The parent chain of RNA transfers information about its sequence to the daughter strand of RNA. How many bits of sequence information are contained in a single chain of RNA? How accurately can this transfer happen? These are some of the questions that David cares about. It turns out that Claude Shannon, back in 1948, while attempting to solve problems in telephone communication for the Bell Phone Company, he actually produced all of the equations that we need to quantify exactly how much sequence information a chain of RNA can hold, and how to quantify just how accurately a given replication system is at transferring that information to the next generation of RNA chains. Now, Claude Shannon, of course, was not talking about RNA, but everything he did is directly applicable if we would just use it. It's all laid out in Shannon's paper, a mathematical theory of communication, and it's just waiting for biochemists to pick it up and, yeah, apply it to their own work. Though David and I don't really talk about it much in this conversation, Shannon's equations can also be used to describe the information transfer that happens between RNA and protein, you know, in the, in the heart of the ribosome, the process of translation. In biology. Please forgive the recording quality of this conversation. Again, it was done on the fly. At one point, the sound goes a little bit shallow, I guess you could say. We lose for a moment some of the richer undertones in David's voice. This is because his apartment door was wide open when an airplane blasted by. When I say blasted, I mean it was so loud that I had to filter it out in post because I was worried that someone might go deaf if they were listening to this conversation on headphones. That said, even with the filter, sufficient data makes it through for you to receive and process all the information that David intended to transmit. This really is an important little conversation. David is a careful thinker and always aims to be precise in communication. I've listened to this conversation several times now while editing. I've even stopped and worked out some of the equations so that I would understand it better. And I'll probably listen to it several more times after it's posted. It really is that valuable. Without further ado, here is Dr. David Fialo talking about sequence information, information entropy, and information transfer at the origin of life. I think it's especially egregious in the field of prebiotic chemistry that when people use this word information, it's not clear exactly what they mean by it, and different people often mean different things by it. Yeah. I think it might actually impede progress. Okay. It, I, I think that a certain definition of information would be useful in understanding the origin of life, 
but because so many people use it flippantly, it, it will be difficult to convince others of the legitimacy of one definition of it. Yeah. That's what I'm going to try and do right now, though. Okay. So, um, in the simplest sense, let's just take a computer as uh, a model system. Yeah. A computer stores information. How does it do that? Well, it does that with bytes, which are composed of eight bits each. Each bit is one of two possibilities, which we call zero and one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what the exact identity of that possibility is, but it matters how many of them there are. Yeah. So uh, one bit is one unit of information. Yeah. Uh, one byte is eight bits. How many different possible bytes are there? There's 256 because Every single bit in the byte has two possibilities. Right. They're all unique. So two to the eighth power is 256. So if I were to say, how much information would I need to specify 256 different states? The answer is one byte or eight bits. Okay. The mathematical definition of that is that, and this this is strictly mathematical, but it's useful in certain cases. The information of some random variable is just the logarithm to whatever base you want of the number of states possible by that uh, random variable, assuming all the outcomes are equally likely. Now, biologically, we can, we can interpret DNA and RNA that way. Yeah. Unlike a computer where each digit has only uh, two possibilities, RNA and DNA, each digit, which is a nucleotide, has one of four possibilities. Right. So that means that in DNA, there are two bits per nucleotide. Mm -hmm. So if you have 100 nucleotides, you have uh, 200 bits of information. But then there's, there's an auxiliary meaning of information, which is important for uh, replication. Suppose I know the sequence of a template strand of RNA. Okay. Um, and suppose this template strand of RNA replicates with a certain fidelity. In other words, it makes mistakes every once in a while. And what do those mistakes do to the predictability of the sequence of the daughter strand? They make it more difficult to predict what the sequence of the daughter strand will be. Right. So the lower the fidelity, the lower the predictability. Mm -hmm. For information to be transferred, there needs to be uh, non-zero predictability. This, uh, this concept is, is totally formalized mathematically and was done so most elegantly by Claude Shannon. He called this concept information entropy. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, in this context, what information in the context of replication really means is that you have the reasonable ability to predict the sequence of the daughter strand based on the template strand. Right. That's what information really is. And I think, I don't wanna to go too deep into the math, but the point is that it can be quantified. Mm -hmm. And there are, I think that there are certain principles that are important to the origin of life that can be mapped out mathematically rigorously. Yeah. But other people, they may mean very, very different things by that. Yeah. So when Lauren Williams talks about information, and I think when Sarah Walker talks about information, I know that when, when Lauren Williams talks about information, he's talking about information transfer between unlike molecules. So you, So he is thinking of information the same way as you, but in the genetic code, he's thinking, can you predict the protein sequence based on the RNA sequence? Um, yeah, that's and, right. Yeah. And so it's, it's that that he really cares about. If that's correct, if that is exactly what he thinks, that is totally uh, amenable to the same mathematical interpretation that I just said. You have yeah. two random variables. Yeah. One is the sequence of DNA. The other is the sequence of the protein. The mathematical treatment would be the exact same. So. Right. Right. And, then I, and I actually, I believe that Sarah Walker's... Um, she she's really interested in the communication between unlike systems so she sees life as layers of communication 
is my understanding of her position. And her and I have talked on Twitter, but I, we haven't talked in person. Talking to different researchers, there does seem to be a, a, a yeah communication errors because people are using the word information differently. I have seen quite a few people talk about it in a Shannon uh, fashion. So, But some people find that definition insufficient because they say that just because you have a bunch of sequences available doesn't mean that that necessarily codes for any function. But the retort I would give to that is that I'm not excluding that at all. I never said that that wasn't important. I just think that the strict mathematical definition of information is something that we should state explicitly and we can move on from there. So. Right. Right. If you have a long enough, if you have a large enough group of RNA molecules that have a random sequence, one of them is going to have a function to do something. Um, yeah. And one of them might have a function that helps it better survive and replicate in that specific environment that you've set up for it. So function is really just, when we talk about function, all we're saying is, is this thing somehow able to maximize its fitness better than its neighbors? That's really what we're asking in, in biology. So the function, yeah. yeah, function is a different thing from information. Yeah, definitely. Like I said uh, when we were talking earlier that from my point of view, the thing that really exists is just replicators that have the ability to modify their local environments to different extents to maximize their fitness. So I think yeah. broadly what function really means is just the set of ways a replicator can interact with its environment. Right, right. Yeah, and that's not... Yeah, that's almost orthogonal to the concept of information. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is separate. And and the same, you know, when we when we're, you're designing a computer, you design a computer so that it's capable of transferring information faithfully from one part of the computer to the other. You don't worry about what that information is going to be. It's for the user. When we're trying to discover an evolvable system that could develop functional entities, you know, that that's all, all we care about is this, is this thing replicating faithfully enough to transfer information from one generation to another without catastrophic failure where you lose all fidelity? Uh, yeah. And, and, and yeah. that threshold is going to change. Like how hard it is, how faithful it needs to be, I think is going to depend on how long the polymer is, right? How long the chain is. Yeah. So we could, we could go down a rabbit hole with this. <laughs> okay. But uh, um, so if you, if you define a fidelity per nucleotide, and obviously for longer sequences, the fidelity will be lower, right? Let me just make one point and we can decide okay. how important this is. But uh, a lot of the time in prebiotic chemistry, we're trying to make oligomers. And one of the biggest problems that's perceived in prebiotic chemistry is how apparently difficult it is to get really long polymers. Yeah, chains. I, <clears throat> yeah, chains. I actually don't see that as a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that all of the experiments that have ever been done in prebiotic chemistry, that all tend toward the conclusion that the oligomers tend to be short is something that we should accept and embrace. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. All right. I hope I can explain this adequately. Suppose that you have a self-replicating molecule that's 20 nucleotides long. Right. It has some mutation rate. Mm -hmm. It, suppose the mutation rate is kind of high, so that it's unlikely that you'll ever get a perfect copy of this 20 nucleotide thing. So that's that could be a problem. But consider this. What if we split that 20 nucleotide replicator in half into two 10 nucleotide replicators? Mm -hmm. Now, the probability that any one of the copies of each of the 10 nucleotide replicators is 100% correct, that probability is still low. But here's the thing. If there are repeated rounds of replication and the daughter strands persist throughout these repeated rounds of replication, all you need to happen is for in one of those rounds, one of the 10 nucleotide replicators gets it right. And in any other, any other round, the other 10 nucleotide replicator gets it right. Yeah. Whereas in the 20 nucleotide replicator case, everything needs to be correct in the same round of replication. Yes, yes. So I think that it's actually, it makes more sense that the oligomers would be shorter at the beginning because it's more, it, it makes more sense to have small cooperating replicators than large 
high fidelity replicators. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me try and try and re rephrase that. So, you're saying that one of the problems in Origin of Life that a lot of people think is a problem is that we're only getting short chains to form. So we're getting like you know, we're getting between 10 and 20 mers with the proteins with the peptides. You're saying that's not a problem because the other problem that we have in Origin of Life is that replication early on is not very faithful. Because like in, in a modern cell, you've got all kinds of really highly evolved enzymes and proofreading and all sorts of things that happen in the genome of an organism to make sure that when the DNA is copied, it's copied faithfully. You do not have any of that in Origin of Life before. And those are all evolved structures. So just by default, replication would have sucked back then. Yes. And so definitely. you're saying that if you have sh a lot, lots of short polymers, lots of short chains, that are able to replicate because they're short, their chances of being replicated perfectly is a lot higher than if they were long. Not only that, it's like, as long as they're cooperating, yes. they could accomplish the same, perhaps the same function as a longer yeah. uh, replicator could, but yeah. they have a much higher chance of coexisting with the correct sequence. Right. Right. So cooperation is key here. And yes. some people might think, oh, cooperation, that sounds crazy. Well, if you look at a genome today, we have genes that are all stuck on one big long chain. And we actually have enzymes that break them out individually in much smaller chunks. So we already see in life, we have a lot of cooperating smaller systems. Furthermore, we already know mathematically how cooperation evolves. This is, this is something that's been really, really well worked out. Uh, if you look at the work of Stuart West and other people, it's, it's a big thing in the, at Oxford where they've been studying this for years. Like cooperation, when you have entities that can evolve, that can, you know, descent with modification acted upon by selection, it is very common for them to evolve to cooperate with one another. And so I... I yeah, and I don't think... I totally agree with everything yeah. you said. So I don't think that cooperation necessarily needs to be anything that sophisticated it could right. be a, as simple as like if two strands of a nucleic acid have one section that is complementary then just at that section they'll bind to each other mm -hmm. and there's a lot of evidence that suggests that when self-assembly occurs resistance to hydrolysis is conferred right. so all i could it, it, cooperation could just be as simple as they agree to stick together and they'll both have a higher chance of surviving if they stick together yeah it could yeah. be that easy yeah, because because they happen to stick together, they happen to be stronger and sturdier. They get when they get bumped around, they don't break in pieces. That's it. Absolutely. That's yep. that's exactly. local cooperation. Uh, yeah, that, that that's really fascinating. So yeah, the cooperating small molecules makes a lot of sense to me, and and I think that really does solve a lot of problems here. So yeah, I think a lot of people are going towards that right now in their research. So yeah. All right. Well, cool, David. That, that was a fun little, uh, little, little mini conversation here. Yeah, dude. I really enjoyed this. So thanks.